December, everyone. It's the last official Mondo Monday of 2020. And we're trying to squeeze as many of the wonderful light holidays celebrated in December as we can. Today we're going to talk about a relatively new holiday. Something joyful that was created out of sadness. More light to counteract the darkness. The week-long African-American holiday of Kwanzaa. You see, Africa is a large continent full of rich customs and many different cultures. But hundreds of years ago, European traders kidnapped hundreds of thousands of people from Africa and shipped them to America before the United States was even formed to force them to work as slaves on the large plantation farms. It didn't matter to the slaveholders which part of Africa they were from, or what language they'd spoken there, what unique holidays or customs they had there, or even if they'd been someone important there, like a king or queen. To the slaveholders, they were all just slaves jumbled up together. And so, over hundreds of years, the enslaved people lost track of the cultures they used to have in Africa. Nowadays, many people have moved from Africa to the United States on purpose, and they bring their specific cultural traditions with them. They can say they are Nigerian American, or Kenyan American, or Somali American, or whatever. And they can share the cultures from that country here. But most African Americans are descended from the enslaved people who can't trace their heritage to any particular culture in Africa. And that was even more true in the 1960s when an African culture scholar named Dr. Maulana Karenga decided to help African Americans reclaim their heritage. Dr. Karenga wanted African Americans to not only learn about the cultures of their ancestors, but to celebrate them too. So he set aside the last week of the year from the day after Christmas to New Year's Day as a festival to do just that and called it Kwanzaa, which means first fruits in Swahili, one of the most common languages of Africa. That makes it a kind of harvest festival like we talked about in the autumn. As we light a candle on the menorah for each of the eight days of Hanukkah, we also light a candle a day on the Kinara for each of the seven days of Kwanzaa. But here, each candle and each day has a particular meaning. Even the colors have meaning. The black candle stands for the people. The red candles stand for their troubles and trials of the past. The green candles stand for hope for the future. Each day of Kwanzaa has a different principle, a different idea to think about and talk about. The first candle we light on the first day is the black candle in the middle. This is for the principle, another Swahili word, of umoja, or unity, standing together as one community. The next night, and the next candle, is a red one. Kuchi chagulia, self-determination being true to yourself, standing up for yourself, making your own decisions. Day three is a green candle, or jima, collective work and responsibility. That just means working together and helping each other. Day four, a red candle, ujama, cooperative economics. Specifically, that means supporting African-American businesses, but basically it just means sharing. 
sharing what you can do, and supporting other people in what they do. Day five, a green candle. Nia, or purpose. Setting goals, or simply having a reason to be here. What is your purpose? Day six, the last red candle, is Kuumba, or creativity. Making or inventing something. It could be arts and crafts, or music, or dance, or storytelling. What can you add to the world to make it a richer, fuller place? And finally, day seven, green, Imani, faith. That means believing. Believing in yourself, in your elders, in a higher power, and believing in each other. Our story today was written specifically to show how the seven principles of Kwanzaa could work in a real life situation, or actually more of a fairy tale situation at least. It's not a story about modern day African Americans celebrating the holiday of Kwanzaa. It's a story instead to show what Kwanzaa is all about. It takes place in Africa, in Ghana, among the Ashanti people. Oh, the Ashanti! That's where Anansi, the god of storytelling, <laughs> comes from. Yes, and this story is written to sound like an old folk tale, like something Anansi <laughs> might tell. But all seven principles of Kwanzaa are worked into the story. Unity, self-determination, working together, sharing, purpose, creativity, and faith. Listen carefully and see if you can see how each of these principles fits into the story. Seven Spools of Thread, a Kwanzaa story by Angela Shelf Medeiros, illustrated by Daniel Minter. In a small African village in the country of Ghana, there lived an old man and his seven sons. After the death of his wife, the old man became both father and mother to the boys. The seven brothers were handsome young men. Their skin was as smooth and dark as the finest mahogany wood. Their limbs were straight and strong as warrior spears. But they were a disappointment to their father. From morning until night, the family's small home was filled with the sound of the brothers quarreling. As soon as the sun brought forth a new day, the brothers began to argue. They argued all morning about how to tend the crops. They argued all afternoon about the weather. It's hot, said the middle son. Nah, -uh, cool breeze is blowing, said the second son. They argued all evening about when to return home. It'll be dark soon, the youngest said. Let's finish this row and begin anew tomorrow. Nah, it's too early to stop, called the third son. Can't you see the sun is setting? shouted the sixth son. And so it will continue until the moon beamed down and the stars twinkled in the sky. At mealtime, the young men argued until the stew was cold and the fufu was hard. You gave him more than you gave me, whined the third son. I divided the food equally, said their father. I was starved with only this small portion on my plate, complained the youngest. Well, if you don't want it, I'll eat it, said the oldest, and he grabbed a handful of meat right off his brother's plate. Stop being so greedy, said the youngest. So it went on, every night. It was often morning before the seven brothers finished dinner. For one sad day, the old man died and he was buried. But at sunrise the next morning, the village chief called the brothers before him. Your father has left an inheritance, said the chief. The brothers whispered excitedly among themselves. I know my father left me everything because I'm the oldest son, said the oldest. I know my father left me everything because I'm the youngest son, said the youngest. Oh, he left everything to me, said the middle son, because I know because I was his favorite said the second son. Everything is mine! Well, the brothers began shouting and shoving. Soon all seven were rolling around on the ground, hitting and kicking each other. 
Stop that this instant, the chief shouted. The brothers stopped fighting. They shook the dust off their clothes and sat before the chief, eyeing each other suspiciously. Your father has decreed that all of his property and possessions will be divided among you equally, said the chief. But first, by the time the moon rises tonight, you must learn how to make gold out of these spools of silk thread. If you do not, you will be turned out of your home as beggars. The oldest brother received blue thread. The next brother red. The next yellow. The middle son was given orange thread. The next green. The next black. And the youngest son received white thread. And for once, the brothers were speechless. The chief spoke again. From this moment forward, you must not argue among yourselves or raise your hands in anger toward one another. If you do, your father's property and all his possessions will be divided equally among the poorest of the villagers instead of you. Go quickly. You only have a little time. The brothers bowed to the chief and hurried away. When the seven Ashanti brothers arrived at their farm, something unusual happened. They sat side by side from oldest to youngest without saying anything unkind to each other. My brothers, the oldest said after a while, let us shake hands and make peace among ourselves. Let us never argue or fight again, said the youngest brother. The brothers placed their hands together and held each other tightly. For the first time in years, peace rested within the walls of their home. My brothers, said the third son quietly, surely our father would not turn us into the world as beggars. I agree, said the middle son. I do not believe our father would have given us the task of turning thread into gold if it were impossible. Could it be, said the oldest son, that there might be small pieces of gold in this thread? The sun beamed hotly overhead. Yellow streams of light crept inside the hut. Each brother held up his spool of thread. The beautiful color sparkled in the sunlight, but there were no nuggets of gold in these spools. I'm afraid not, my brother, said the sixth son, but that was a good idea. Thank you, my brother, said the oldest. Could it be, said the youngest, that by making something from this thread, we could earn a fortune in gold? Perhaps, said the oldest. We could make cloth of this thread and sell it. I believe we can do it. Well, that is a good plan, said the middle son. But we do not have enough of any one color to make a full bolt of cloth. Well, what if, said the third son, we weave the thread together and make a cloth of many colors? Uh, our people do not wear cloth like that, said the fifth son. We wear only cloth of one color. Well, maybe, said the second, we could make a cloth that's so special everyone will want to wear it. My brothers, said the sixth son, we could finish faster if we all work together. Oh, I know we can succeed, said the middle son. So the seven Ashanti brothers went to work. Together they cut the wood to make a loom. The younger brothers held the pieces together while the older brothers assembled the loom. Then they took turns weaving cloth out of their spools of thread. They made a pattern of stripes and shapes that looked like the wings of birds. They used all the colors, blue, red, yellow, orange, green, black, and white. Soon the brothers had several pieces of beautiful multicolored cloth. When the cloth was finished, the seven brothers took turns neatly folding the brightly colored fabric. Then they placed it into seven baskets and put the baskets on their heads. The brothers formed a line from the oldest to the youngest and began their journey to the village. The sun slowly made a golden path across the sky. The brothers hurried down the long dusty road as quickly as they could. As soon as they entered the marketplace, the seven Ashanti brothers called out, 
Come and buy the most wonderful cloth in the world. Come, buy the most wonderful cloth in the world. They unfolded a bolt and held it up for all to see. The multicolored fabric glistened like a rainbow. A crowd gathered around the seven Ashanti brothers. Oh, said one villager, I've never seen cloth so beautiful. Look at that unusual pattern. Ah, said another, this is the finest fabric in all the land. Feel the texture. The brothers smiled proudly. Suddenly a man dressed in magnificent robes pushed his way to the front of the crowd. Everyone stepped back respectfully. It was the king's treasurer. He rubbed the cloth between the palms of his hands and he held it up to the sunlight. What a thing of beauty, he said, fingering the material. This cloth will make a wonderful gift for the king. I must have all of it. The seven brothers whispered together. Cloth fit for a king, said the oldest, should be purchased at a price only a king can buy. It is yours for one bag of gold. Sold, said the king's treasurer. He untied his bag of gold and spilled out many pieces for his brothers. The seven Ashanti brothers ran out of the marketplace and back down the road to their village. A shining silver moon began to creep up in the sky. Panting and dripping with sweat, the brothers threw themselves before the chief's hut. Oh, chief, said the oldest, we've turned the thread into gold. The chief came out of his hut and sat upon a stool. The oldest brother poured the gold out onto the ground. Have you argued or fought today? asked the chief. No, my chief, said the youngest. We've been too busy working together to argue or fight. Hmm, then you've learned the lesson your father sought to teach you, said the chief. All that he had is now yours. The older brother smiled happily, but the youngest son looked sad. What about all the poor people in the village, he asked. We receive an inheritance, but what will they do? Perhaps, said the oldest, we can teach them how to turn thread into gold. The chief smiled. You learned your lesson very well. The seven Ashanti brothers taught their people carefully. The village became famous for its beautiful multicolored cloth and the villagers prospered. From that day until this, the seven Ashanti brothers have worked together farming the land and they have worked peacefully in honor of their father. In the back of this book, it shows you how you can do your own weaving. See if you can turn your weaving into gold. But the most important thing, did you find all seven principles of Kwanzaa in this story? Well, let's see. Unity. The seven brothers had to stop arguing and support each other in order to solve their problem. Number two, self-determination. Well, they were determined to succeed. They decided they would do it and work together to do it and how to do it. They decided their cloth was the most wonderful cloth in the world. Oh, and when the king's treasurer wanted their fabric, they set their own price, gold, which meant it would solve their father's riddle. They decided how it would be done and they stood up for it. Hmm. Number three, working together. Well, that's easy. The brothers had to work together to succeed. They built the loom together and they combined their different colors together. They couldn't have done it alone. Number four, cooperative economics. Oh, once they figured out how popular and valuable their multicolored cloth could be, they taught everyone else in the village to make it too, so that everyone could make a living selling the cloth. Hmm. Five, purpose. Well, their purpose was to solve their father's puzzle and earn their inheritance. And many times they said, 
We will do this. And they worked toward that goal in their mind. Number six, creativity. Well, they were creative by deciding to weave all their colors together in new patterns, even if no one had ever woven that cloth that way before. They were also creative just by finding a solution to their father's riddle in the first place. Faith. Number seven. Even though the task seemed impossible, they trusted that their father wouldn't give them something they couldn't achieve. And they kept cheering each other on. We can do it, they kept saying. They believed. Oh, and their father believed in them too. He knew they could put aside their quarrels and work together if they really tried. Well, how can you live up to these seven principles in your life? It's something to think about for the new year. Well, we hope this holiday season is full of light for you, whichever holidays you may celebrate. And we'll see you again in the new year to share more stories from all over El Mundo. Oh, thank you, thank you.